Wow, that's a pretty hard act to follow. Hello, Melbourne. Thank you for having me. We have an action-packed lineup for our panel today on mild traumatic brain injury, post-concussion syndrome, and the hot topic of chronic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Hard word to say for me. We have a series of presentations. I'll invite our speakers to actually come up and uh, take their seats at the panel now. And uh, you'll be able to ask questions uh, throughout the sessions and at the conclusion of the presentations. Nick has given us an extra five minutes to run through to lunch, but that's Nick's um, prerogative as the conference organiser. The conference bios are all available on Brain Injury Australia's website because these people have done way too much for me to actually uh, comment on it during this panel. But why am I allowed on the stage without being a professor? Um, as Nick alluded to, I have been involved with Brain Injury Australia for several years now after my eldest son actually experienced a mild traumatic brain injury when a locker fell on his head at school. Mild doesn't really cut it. Mild does not describe the symptoms that people experience with post-concussion syndrome or even a concussion most of the time. Uh, I've actually just returned from a rock star style tour of the USA concussion clinics and the landscape in that environment is significantly different from what we actually have available with our stressed resources here. When I'm in Sydney and not touring the United States, I'm currently supporting about 37 to 100 families every week uh, who are trying to find resources for their children's individualised recoveries. And mainly I listen and direct them to the people who I think can help them most. In supporting these families, I often use an analogy. That's quite strange, we don't have aliens on the stage, but it's important that this analogy identifies why we have this panel put together. And the analogy I use is of the movie The Martian, starring Matt Damon. Everyone familiar with that movie? Great, okay. So basically, quickly, um, The Martian is about six NASA astronauts on a space mission for 30 days on Mars. What could possibly go wrong, right? Anyway, a massive storm approaches that they're not expecting and the six astronauts have to abort the mission and head safely back to their spaceship. I liken the storm to a mild traumatic brain injury or a concussion. The person's not expecting it particularly and it wreaks havoc on their life. It can be from anything from military combat, domestic violence, a locker falling on your head, a basketball injury, a box falling on your head when you're at work. It can be from anything. But it's still a storm and it still wreaks havoc. Six of the astronauts experience the storm, all six of them. Five of them make it safely to the spaceship. One, Matt Damon, luckily with a history of survival, remains. And that's roughly the number of people who go on to experience life-altering chronic symptoms from a mild traumatic brain injury. So, one of the things that I, I do when I talk to people is they tell me about well, how that analogy works for them and this is what they've got to say. Nobody really knows that Matt Damon's on Mars for a while. The second thing is he doesn't want to be there. The third thing is no one can tell him why he's there, how long he's going to be there and the worst part of it is that we're facing at the moment is nobody really knows how to get him home. So this is what people also had to say. Actually, they had a lot more to say, but this is what I can include. Um, if you asked a school or workplace insurer, they would tell you that Mars doesn't actually exist and that Matt Damon's just bunging it on for a compo claim. <laughs> the hospital emergency departments would tell you they actually don't know anything about Mars, but here's a lovely leaflet to let you know what you can expect during your stay. The state health departments would tell him to rest because that's what's currently in the State Health Department guidelines for New South Wales. But luckily that's actually going to change. There's a new draft being pushed around that actually looks a bit more sensible. And finally, just like Mars, it seems that it's actually very difficult to follow a process and find access to care. But this is what I really like about the movie, and this is why our panel is really relevant today, is that finally the beautiful Matt Damon makes it off Mars and he heads back to Earth. Not in his original form, but enough like himself that he feels like he's been rescued. He makes it off because a team of very clever people think specifically about his situation 
and what they need to do to bring him home. They work as a team. They work with people that they wouldn't have normally worked with previously. They work specifically for him. They don't use a failed plan to get someone else off Neptune from 20 years ago and just give it a whirl. They actually think specifically about his situation. And they cannot get him home by just going, you'll be OK, Matt. Uh, he has some off-label medication. We'll wave a pencil in front of your face and give me a call in three months if you're still stuck there. So the people we have today are willing to think innovatively about post-concussion syndrome, mild traumatic brain injury, and the larger picture of what it means for that one in six that don't actually recover spontaneously. We have the whole spectrum from concussion right through to Professor Michael Buckland with um, CTE. And so we've got a lot of interesting presentations today. Without further ado, I'd actually like to welcome Melbourne School student Ethan Cheeswright to the podium to speak about his experiences with concussion and the decisions he's had to make. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Um, as you know, I'm Ethan Cheeswright, and personally, I'd like to see some changes in how concussions are managed in young athletes in Australia. Um, my personal story, I suffered four concussions within 18 months of each other, all very different, and if I knew what I knew now, my life story would be rather different. These concussions, but mainly the management of these injuries, have actually forced me to abandon my dreams of an AFL career and have seen me change significantly as a son, a person and a student. On the 23rd of July 2017, age 15, I sustained my first concussion. This concussion was followed two weeks later by my second one in my first game back, and my third coming in April of last year, which was my introduction to post-concussion syndrome. These concussions were then followed by a fourth this year, which, was an, which was, could have been called my final blow. Before these concussions, I led much of an idyllic life for a 15-year-old. You know, as you see, I was playing a lot of sport, doing quite well. I was, had a thriving social life, thriving academic life. I was happy and the world was genuinely at my feet. With my first concussion, a clash of heads saw me hit the ground and fall unconscious. Immediately following regaining consciousness, I wanted to get back on the field, a desire that was encouraged by my coaches who were also desperate to get me back out there in the same game. And if it wasn't for my father who intervened, I probably would have returned. I visited a hospital for in Melbourne for assessment and was diagnosed with concussion and advised to attend school the next day. Similar to a normal concussion, I experienced symptoms of dizziness, nauseous, nauseousness and headaches, which made, made, a which made it difficult for me to concentrate during school. Ten days later, I was given the all clear by my doctor after lying to the doctor about my symptoms. Obviously, as an athlete, it's not a good idea to lie about injuries, especially those in terms of a head injury. But the pressures of being a junior sports person, mixed with this uneducation around head injury, got in the way of this common sense. I was so desperate to return that I lied about my lingering symptoms. I didn't understand that concussion was not a trivial injury, nor did I realise that as a mild traumatic brain injury, you must respect the injury and fully recover before returning to play. I was ignorant and I'm definitely not alone in this ignorance. My second concussion came in my first game back. 14 days later, on Sunday the 6th of August 2017. A clash of heads with a player from the opposing team left me unconscious. Where I began to, it was here, after the second concussion, where I began to become acquainted with the fact that concussion was not just a sporting injury. I was confused as to why the injury that I was told would just be a one to two week injury was affecting my, my everyday life more than a month after it occurred. Following this concussion, I was able to return to playing footy and competed in the pre-season of 2018 and the first couple of games of 2018. My third concussion happened on Sunday, April 15, 2018, playing for my local club. I'd just been announced in the under-16 Victorian Metro football squad and my football was an absolute pinnacle. Not to mention my academic, social life and everything in between being at an all-time high. Again, this feeling of the world being genuinely at my feet. During this game for my local club, I was tackled twice in a rather dangerous manner that led me to sustaining significant head knocks. 
the second of which laid me unconscious. This concussion was my introduction to post-concussion syndrome. Experiencing constant headaches, extreme difficulty in concentrating, inability to complete simple tasks, forgetfulness, constant anxiety, and an inability to sleep led me to experiencing a very difficult time where I'd often spend hours in my room crying in solitude. Post-concussion syndrome did take away a lot of my identity. It really felt like there was someone else living in Ethan Cheeserat's life during this time, or I wasn't really myself. I was watching from this third person state as everything passed me by. I watched while hundreds of talented players waltzed right past me in selection for different teams and on draft boards. I watched my friends attend dozens of social events. I watched my, I watched my grades drop to a worrying level and I watched my parents and, f and family become confused as my irrationality at school, which led me to getting in significant trouble. Again, I was able to make a full recovery and continue to playing football. My fourth concussion, though, was something different. It occurred on the 6th of April, my debut game for the Northern Knights under-18 team, an opportunity I'd worked so hard for and dreamed of since I was very young. It was by far and away the biggest game of my life, so in a similar manner to the previous concussions, the world was again at my feet. The concussion, which was obtained from a slight hit to the back of the head, going, was, was obtained from a slight hit to the back of the head, was again a hard pill to swallow. Going from being on the absolute top of the world a year before to only to have to, only to, have to deal with post-concussion syndrome, depression and anxiety, to, full, to then make a full recovery to playing football, and then to have the exact same thing happen to me almost exactly a year later was some sort of heartbreak. Following this concussion, I was referred to a follow-up clinic at the Austin Hospital where a comprehensive report was taken on my state. Sorry. There we go. So here's the report. I was described as someone who was presented with anodynia with marked psychometer retardation, reduced reactivity, poor eye contact, a sparsity of spontaneous conversation and an economy of content in response to direct inquiry. All of these features being vastly different to my normal state, hence consolidating this feeling of my true identity being taken from me. But I'm not here just to talk about my story about concussion. I've been involved in junior AFL for over 10 years as a coach, a player and a spectator for multiple clubs. So despite being a teenager, my knowledge and experience around concussion management is in such circles is quite extensive. During this time period, I never received baseline testing. Despite my vast experiences in high-level AFL clubs, not once did I receive baseline testing. The education that coaches receive surrounding concussion is little to none. The protocols in place for elite sports are largely ignored at junior level, not through malice, but ignorance and lack of support and training. Coaching staff and managers, and whichever parent runs the sideline or is in charge of first aid on the day is not trained in concussion management. Education in the form of a one to two hour session at the start of the year surely shouldn't be that hard to organise and would do wonders. To add to this, medical clearance in returning to play protocols must be enforced more strongly. I was never asked for any medical clearance in returning to play. The importance of receiving medical clearance to prevent further injury and allow the athlete to properly recover must be put in higher regard. Players with multiple concussions must be warned about the potential consequences of numerous concussions and supported through a potential decision to stop playing football. There are so many kids in the AFL system that are so desperate to continue to play, to play that they ignorantly put it all on, the, all on the line. In terms of recovery process, for me personally, I found neurophysio, hypnotherapy and regular visits to a GP or doctor to be the most effective methods. In saying this, Concussion recovery is a lonely, lonely place. The invisible injury can put even the most outgoing of people back in their shells. Concussion brought my life to an absolute halt. Being completely isolated from the world and not being able to sleep meant I not only had to face the brutal reality of concussion symptoms, failing school and losing f social circles, but many other issues. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this struggle. 
Concussion makes people hit pause on their lives, and in a world that runs a million miles an hour, it is a very hard thing to do. So if you are to take anything from my speech today, please let it be this. Psychological health is the most important thing to monitor in recovery. Parents and carers should not rush back teenagers, whether that be to school or to sport. Instead, parents and carers should allow the patient to work at their own pace and while monitoring their psychological health closely. It may be hard to deal with one's irrationality and invisible symptoms, but imagine how they feel. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. That was brilliant to share that and a big story to tell.